All right, I bet you guys are sick of looking at these two equations by now, but too bad, we gotta look at them again. Photosynthesis is our top one. Photosynthesis reactants are CO2, water, and then you can add in sunlight. It's not really a chemical, but still on the left side, still a reactant. It's going to produce C6H12O6 and oxygen. If you forgot what this guy is, this is just the chemical equation for glucose, C6H12O6. The organism going through photosynthesis is going to take the sunlight and it's going to convert it into the glucose, which is the sugar, using this little thing right here. This is the organelle inside photosynthesizers called the chloroplast. So now we have a little bit of sugar, a little bit of glucose, and a little bit of oxygen. We then have to go to the next process, which is cellular respiration. Now I'm gonna take my C6H12O6 glucose and my oxygen. Now it's on the left, now it's my reactant. I'm gonna process it and spit out some CO2, some water, and some cell energy. This is on the right, so it's my product. This all happens in this organelle, the mitochondria. And as we've gone over a thousand times before, the products and the reactants are basically flip-flopped. Reactant becomes product on that one, and product becomes reactant on that one. It helps you to remember some kind of flip-flop, or some, some actual like shoe, to know that they flip. Cool. If it doesn't, also cool. So, like I said, we are hammering this again because now we actually need to look at the part that we skipped over last time. We know that we started out with sunlight over here. This is the type of energy we started out with. We didn't really do anything else in our equation. We ended up with CO2 and water and we created glucose, but then we used glucose. So what was the whole point? Well, the whole point was that we took solar energy from sunlight and created chemical energy in the cell. Up until now, we haven't even mentioned what this thing is called, and that is what we are doing now. The type of cell energy that the cells are gonna use is called ATP. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. We'll almost always call it ATP, but if you understand what triphosphate means, then it makes it a little easier to understand. This is what it looks like, and it looks very, very similar to DNA because it starts out with a sugar. In this case, ribose sugar. This little bundle over here is adenine, and then all the way to the right, we have three little circles that are all phosphates. Adenosine triphosphate. Tri, three. 3 phosphate. So after all that conversion, after both of those formulas from photosynthesis and converting the mitochondria, we ended up with this thing, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is the actual cellular energy. Remember, the mitochondria serves to basically make the energy usable. Glucose, sugar, is technically energy. But remember, think of it like a potato chip bag. You have a bag that has food inside. So sometimes people will accidentally be like, hey look I got food, and they hold up the bag. They don't mean eat the bag. They mean you're still gonna have to use your hands, open up the bag to get to the actual food. In this kind of weird analogy, the potato chip bag is glucose and the chips inside are the ATP. So the mitochondria serves to break open and process the glucose and actually get the ATP. It can use glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, but mitochondria is gonna open up a packet of energy. So this is where the actual energy is stored. Think of these black lines as rubber bands under tension. If I come in and I cut this line right here in between the second and third phosphate, and if that was a rubber band and it's under tension, when I cut it, both ends are going to kind of snap back to the left and back to the right. This is going to release energy. This is how we store the energy in ATP. When I need a release of energy, I'm gonna go in and break the bond between the second and the third phosphate that releases my stored energy that I spent all of cellular respiration trying to create. My cells can then use it for whatever process they want. So now, I've broken that bond. So I no longer have that bond or that third phosphate. Now I only have two, which means I am no longer a triphosphate, I am adenosine diphosphate. So ATP is used up and becomes ADP. I broke off my energy and used it, and I have the remaining adenine, ribose, and two phosphate groups, because all the energy was right here where that bond was. Now, I like to use a rechargeable battery analogy for this. If you have a rechargeable battery, you've used up the energy, 
you didn't destroy the actual battery casing, like the green part of the actual battery. So now I'm left with a DP, which is basically an uncharged battery. I need to recharge this, so I have kind of the shell. All I need to do is I need to find another P, another phosphate, and click it back on. So let's say this is my rechargeable battery. I eat some more food, or I go through photosynthesis and make some glucose. My mitochondria processes the energy. I can add on that third phosphate. And then once again, because I now have three phosphates, adenosine triphosphate is what it becomes, ATP. And this cycle is gonna go all the way around and around and around. The process creates ATP. Also, just so you know, usually ATP has like a squiggly line around it to represent energy. I take one of the phosphates off, and that releases my energy wherever it needs to go. Maybe to a muscle cell, maybe to a brain cell, whatever. I am now ADP, because I lost that phosphate. I eat some more food, I process some more energy, I add a phosphate back on. I now go from ADP back to my ATP, and I am bringing in and storing energy. So now I have a fully charged battery. So right here I'm charged, I release some energy, down here I'm uncharged, and then I store some energy, and around and around it goes. Charged battery at ATP, and uncharged battery at ADP. When it gets low, I recharge it, I use it. I keep it around to recharge it again. So now we know what ATP and what that cell energy we've been learning about at the end of cellular respiration actually is. So, there's a couple ways we can create ATP. It's not just a one lane road. There are many different pathways. Remember that aerobic means with oxygen. We know this from a couple of the units. Anaerobic is without oxygen. So if I'm gonna do something aerobically, I'm going to need oxygen. I need the presence of oxygen. If I'm gonna do something anaerobically, I don't need oxygen to do it. I can actually make ATP in both of these scenarios. There's gonna be times when I have lots of oxygen, and it's great because I can process my glucose for ATP. There's also times when I'm not gonna have a whole bunch of oxygen, but I still need to be able to make energy because I don't wanna die. Here are those two pathways. It doesn't really matter how I got the glucose in the beginning, but the fact is I have glucose. So, into the cell it goes. The glucose has made its way into the cell, into the goop of the cell basically, into the cytoplasm. It's then going to go through a splitting process. And it's not like mitosis and it's not like binary fission. I just need to break this apart a little bit before I can start grinding it up and using it for energy. So it's going to go through a sugar splitting process called glycolysis. This is how I'm going to jumpstart my energy conversion. So now is where I have a decision to make. If I have oxygen available, I can go along this path. However, if I don't have oxygen available, I'll do kind of a Ghostbusters thing over here so you know there's no oxygen. I have to follow the bottom path. So with oxygen, I'm going to do some kind of aerobic respiration. And without it, I need to do some kind of anaerobic respiration. Remember, this is all getting done by the organelle that's going through cellular respiration, which is our mitochondria. Aerobic respiration is very efficient. It's actually better to have oxygen. This is actually going to yield or create 36 units of ATP. 36 different adenosine triphosphate molecules, which is good. Mitochondria is going to process all of this because this is cellular respiration happening inside that organelle. This is all going to happen inside the mitochondria, and it's going to go through a couple things that we don't need to dive into too much. All you need to know is that there is something inside the mitochondria called the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Again, you will get into these way more in like advanced biology, either AP or college biology. So for now, we just need to know that those are inside the mitochondria happening. The Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain are going to process glucose in order to get the most ATP possible from aerobic respiration. So the blue path is obviously what we want. However, sometimes we don't have enough oxygen to meet the energy demands of what's going on. So anaerobic is when we don't have a lot of oxygen available or we don't have enough to meet the demands. It's not a very good, efficient breakdown of glucose. It's actually a little bit incomplete. So we're not gonna yield as much ATP. You're actually only gonna yield about two ATP per glucose molecule. So in one ball of glucose, in one ring of glucose, that you worked really hard to make or eat or whatever, aerobic gives you 36 ATP. 
from that one, anaerobic would only give you two. That's 18 times less efficient without oxygen. So if you have the choice, you always want to try to have aerobic respiration happening because there's plenty of oxygen for us. It's a lot easier to get than glucose. There are two types of anaerobic respiration. First one is what we're familiar with. It's called lactic acid fermentation. This is what things like humans do, that animals do. You also have something called alcoholic fermentation. I'm going to abbreviate that so it doesn't look all squished. The only thing that goes through alcoholic fermentation really is certain bacteria and yeast. It seems like we should just be able to stay in anaerobic respiration and we're going to burn a lot of glucose. So you're like, hey, if I'm going to lose weight, why would I not just try to get into anaerobic exercise and burn off all my energy, burn off all my extra calories, burn off all my fat. It seems really easy, right? The problem is each one of the anaerobic processes has a byproduct, a waste product that is not good, that is a lot harder to cycle out than aerobic byproducts. The byproduct is, in the name, lactic acid and alcohol. Lactic acid fermentation is going to actually produce lactic acid, which if you've ever run for a long time and your muscles have started to burn, that is the buildup of that acid. That means you ran out of oxygen to process, to get the energy to run, and you are now running in anaerobic respiration. Yeasts and bacteria will go through alcoholic fermentation and their byproduct is ethyl alcohol. This is how you make alcohol. This is why people will put corn or a mash or some kind of food and some kind of sugar in with yeast into those big silver brewing vats for like beer. The byproduct is alcohol and CO2. So you're gonna get a lot of those two things coming out of that process. So now that you know the two ways to process the glucose, you can actually recognize when you switch from aerobic to anaerobic. For example, say you go out on the track and I say, I want you to walk one lap. You walk one lap. If you're even remotely healthy, you're probably not burning after walking one lap. You're like, okay, there we go. Then I'm gonna say, walk another lap a little bit faster. And you're gonna keep doing this every time you hit a lap maybe jogging eventually once it becomes too fast and you're going to keep increasing your speed. Eventually, there is going to be a point where all of a sudden you start to burn. That means, and I mean specifically in the muscles you're using, like your calves or your quads, this means that you jumped from aerobic respiration, which was very, very efficient, producing 36 ATP per glucose, into anaerobic respiration, which is inefficient, but it was still producing 2 ATP. If you didn't have a way to make energy when you didn't have oxygen, you would have just fallen over once you breached the aerobic ceiling. The burn in your muscles is that lactic acid building up from the anaerobic fermentation process, the lactic acid fermentation. People can actually raise their aerobic ceiling. The better trained, like the more they work out and the more they run, they will actually get into anaerobic respiration at a later time. If you were to do the test I just told you where you slowly increase your speed per lap and you were doing it with a marathon runner as like a buddy, he would feel the burn much later than you because his body has become more efficient. He has adapted through exercise to actually use oxygen more efficiently. This is just extra information, but we usually can measure this by what's called a VO2 max. We can actually measure the amount of oxygen you're able to take into your lungs per breath and absorb it and process it, which is again, that means they can all, if they can stay in aerobic respiration when you're in anaerobic, they are going to be, they're gonna be able to 18 times further because they can make 18 times the energy for their cells per glucose. So it's good that animals can kind of adapt and become better at staying in aerobic exercise, eventually they will hit that lactic acid fermentation. Our bacteria and yeast, on the other hand, will go through alcoholic fermentation if they run out of oxygen. But your body knows this. Your body wants to keep oxygen going. This is why you breathe deeper and more rapidly when you start to get exercise and you start to get tired. Your body is like, we need to be able to process and get 36 ATP rather than two. So it's going to try to get as much oxygen as physically possible. Eventually your body will process out the lactic acid. So if you were to do that little test and you start sprinting and burning, but then you walk a couple laps, maybe the burning goes away. 
but if you continue to stay in anaerobic exercise, the lactic acid builds up more and more and more, and before you know it, it's such an intense burn that it'll actually start to interact and shut down muscle function, and it'll actually mess with how your muscles contract. So you can power through it a little bit, and sometimes your coach, if you're playing sports, will tell you to suck it up and push through the pain or push through the burn or whatever, but eventually it will, on a molecular biological level, shut you down. However, the more you get into that anaerobic respiration state, the better your body is at dealing with it. You'll eventually hit that anaerobic state on the fourth lap. You train for a couple weeks, a couple months, a couple years, then it's increasing maybe the sixth lap you get the burn, then the eighth lap, then the tenth, the twelfth, the fourteenth, sixteenth, and eventually you can stay in aerobic respiration for a very long period of time. Marathon runners want to stay in aerobic respiration and pace themselves as much as possible. So this is why it's better to find a pace where you're just under your anaerobic threshold and you're still getting the maximum amount of ATP for yourselves. There's no reason if you're running a two mile race to sprint all out the first lap because now you've jumped straight into anaerobic exercise and you've burned up a bunch of glucose to get two ATP per glucose, that's stupid. You could have jogged it and paced yourself and conserved your glucose and you can go longer because you're getting 18 times more ATP, 18 times more energy with oxygen. So if your buddy is faster than you or can run longer than you, he may be genetically gifted, but that's okay. When you train, your body will adapt. You can get used to this. Your body will be an ATP creating machine. And the more efficient the machine, the more efficient the product.